Okay. So, good afternoon almost, ladies and gentlemen. Our topic today, the human rights. Human rights. Uh, what I did, I, uh, my speech kind of has two parts. And it, they're sort of about the topic of human rights, both of them. Um, but they're not directly related in my speech. So it's sort of like Monty Python and now about something completely different. So the first part, and, and my speech probably will be a bit longer than 10 minutes. So you will have time to warm up and get into the groove and uh, get a sense of uh, the speaker's style and the content and the story. I will try to speak slowly. This is something that I would like to work on. If I, I will try and monitor my interpreters. If you feel I'm going too fast, maybe do this with your hand and let me know so that I can slow down. <laughs> or I'll probably see you panicking in the booth. So, okay, so the uh, first part is just a very uh, brief sketch of the statistics as it pertains to the European Court of Human Rights uh, when it works with Russia the kind of uh, applications that have been filed in the past 20 years um, and how many claims have been satisfied and how many rulings, etc. And the second part, I will talk about uh, the most recent, probably the, the, the uh, a human rights campaign they have, that, that has started recently <coughs> that has, you know, was launched by Oleg Sentsov, who is a political prisoner, is a Ukrainian filmmaker, a political prisoner in Russia. Um, this is his picture. Um, I don't know if our audience, our audience can see this, the screen, but you can find um, lots of information about him online. So I'll talk about him, I'll just tell you the story basically in chronological order, what happened, when, and where are we at right now. Okay, so part one, the European Court of Human Rights. So this is an international court which is based in Strasbourg in France. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights was established by the European Convention on Human Rights on January 21st, 1959. Um, it has 47 contracting states. Basically, these are all member states of the Council of Europe, not to be confused with the European Council. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights deals with applications that allege um, a contracting state or a number of contracting states have violated one or more um, norms of the human rights or provisions, uh, human rights provisions that are set, set out in the Convention and its protocols. So when I say the convention, I mean the convention, the European Convention on Human Rights. I'll just use the term convention for short. An application to the court can be lodged by an individual person, can be lodged by a group of individuals, by a state, or by a number of states. Now, the European Court of Human Rights started uh, working with Russia 20 years ago. So, Russia joined the Council of Europe on February 28, 1996 um, and uh, began to work with the court on May 5, 1998, when the convention came into force in Russia. So now I'll just briefly give you some statistics. There are lots of numbers. Some of them are quite big, but I'll try to go reasonably slow. Um, so the total number of applications that the court received from Russia was 148,688. Um, out of this number, almost 92% were found inadmissible by the court. So they did not meet the standards, the requirements set out by the court for an application to be processed. So this 92%, almost 92%, it, it's uh, 136,580. And at the same time, 
uh, Russia's share of the court's annual operational budget is 33 million euros. Now, most claims satisfied by the court pertain to the violation of Article 6 of the Convention. So this is the right to fair trial. So most complaints that the court receives from Russia allege that the Russia has violated Article 6. Uh, and here we're talking about uh, 1,093 claims. Uh, next, uh, the next most popular uh, article to be violated is Article 3 of the Convention. It's the ban on torture. There were 994 applications that allege that Russia uh, violated Article 3. Uh, the next one is Article 5, the right to liberty and security of person, 932 applications. Uh, then follows Article 2, the life to right, 595 applications. And finally, uh, the least number of applications pertain to Article 1 of the Protocol 1 to the uh, Convention the right to peaceful enjoyment of one's possessions. Uh, the number of those applications is 593. So this is just a very brief summary of uh, statistics of the, of the work of the court with the Russian Federation uh, for the past uh, 20 years. Okay, so there is no direct relation um, to the story I'm going, I'm going to tell, the story of Alexandrov. Um, so, who is Oleg Sentsov? You probably heard this name if you watched the news, you're probably remotely kind of familiar with the story, with the context. Uh, he's a Ukrainian filmmaker, born in Simferopol in Crimea. He was born in 1976. Uh, I will not go through the list of his movies, uh, just in the interest of time, you can uh, find them online. Um, so in 2014, he joined the Euromaidan political protest movement in Ukraine. Then he became uh, an activist of the Automaidan movement. So this is a political protest movement that led to the establishment of the uh, pro-European government in Ukraine, which is currently in power. And that's why Ukraine got in trouble. We, we know the story, so this is the backstory. So during the 2014 Crimean crisis, um, Alexandrov helped deliver food and supplies to Ukrainian soldiers who uh, became to be trapped in their base in, um, in Crimea. So in, 2000, in May of 2014, Sensov was arrested in Crimea by the Federal Security uh, Service of Russia. He was arrested on uh, suspicion of terrorism. So there was a group of four people that were, uh, so three more people were tried together with Sensov, which I will get to uh, later. But he was arrested because one of those four people denounced him. Basically, he was tortured and he, he, he later became the main witness of the prosecution during the trial. But that's how he was arrested. So him and three other people were accused by the Federal Security Service um, of being part of a terrorist community, uh, setting fire to the offices of some pro-Russian organizations in Simferopol, uh, plotting terrorist attacks on bridges, power lines, public monuments, and various cities in Crimea. They were accused in being members uh, of uh, Ukraine's nationalist paramilitary group right sector. So these are very heavy charges in Russia. So after he was arrested in Crimea, he was held in Moscow, in a, in a Moscow prison, all four of them, the, the group of uh, four people. So in an attempt to uh, force him to confess, um, the uh, Federal Security Service used torture, he was beaten, he was uh, threatened with rape. Um, so that wasn't, that wasn't pretty. Now, on, uh, in July 2014, he was tried on fabricated charges of terrorism. So it was a trial. Uh, and the main witness, so this is the person who I mentioned earlier, the person who denounced him, 
um, the main witness for the prosecution retracted his testimony in court, saying that the testimony was given under duress. So, but the trial nevertheless went on, and uh, on August 25th, 2014, Sinsov was found guilty, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Uh, the charges are widely believed to be fabricated, not just in Russia, in, in the world, the uh, international community believes that the charges were fabricated, and his guilt was never proven beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, note that he never pleaded guilty, and he never denounced anyone. Because at some point he was given a choice, you can have seven years um, at a correctional facility if you give us some names. So in the end, he received uh, 20 years. And at the moment, he's serving his sentence in the Beli Medved Correctional Colony. Beli Medved means uh, a polar bear. It's the name of the correctional facility. In the town of uh, Labetnangi, which I can't even say in Russian, in the Yamal and Inez Autonomous District in the Arctic region. So I, I believe it's probably the most northern part of Russia. So now the question, of course, you, you may ask, what does Ukraine do, uh, do in, in the meantime? So Ukrainian filmmaker arrested, tried, imprisoned by Russia. Is there any kind of process? Does Ukraine, is Ukraine doing anything in an attempt to release him, to um, get him released? So now I'll tell you um, a bit of a story, what happened when, um, the, uh, when Crimea became part of the Russian Federation. Um, so the Crimean Peninsula uh, was annexed from Ukraine by Russia in February, March 2014. There was a military intervention. This is something you also remember, of course. So Putin says, no military annexation. The citizens of Crimea will vote in a referendum. So there was a referendum where the residents were supposed to express their opinion whether they want to remain part of Ukraine or they want to be annexed to Russia, become Russian citizens. The referendum was held on March 16, 2014. According to the official results, 95% of the voters voted in favor of seceding from Ukraine and joining Russia. On March, 9, on March 18, 2014, the treaty was signed, the Treaty uh, of the Republic of Crimea uh, and Russia was signed between the representatives of uh, the Republic of Crimea and Russia. So now the question becomes, what happens to all the residents that uh, went to bed in one country and woke up in another? So what happened was this, all residents were automatically granted a Russian citizenship unless they applied to authorities within a month after the treaty was signed. So they had until April 18, 2014 to submit a formal application and um, uh, give up their uh, Russian citizenship and become Ukrainian citizens. So what happened, uh, Ukraine cannot help Sinsov because Russia claims that he never uh, gave up his Ukrainian citizenship. He is a Russian citizen, which is very convenient. And that's why there have been no negotiations of uh, any kind of exchange or uh, any intervention on the part of the consulate, Ukrainian consulate, uh, or any other diplomatic efforts, simply because Russia claims him to be a Russian citizen, so case closed. OK. so. Now, the uh, recent development, on May 14, 2018, Sinsov went on an open-ended hunger strike. So his only demand is the release of all the Ukrainian political prison prisoners in Russia. So he presented the authorities with a list, and he himself is not on that list. He timed the strike, obviously, with the World Cup. So, of course, now there's lots of attention 
on Russia, lots of focus. So he was hoping to use the this big international event to um, bring to, to draw attention to not just to his situation, but to the situation with political prisoners, Ukrainian political prisoners in Russia. Now, a group of Ukrainian activists have launched the Save Oleg Sinsov campaign. So on uh, June 1st and 2nd, rallies were held across the world to support him in Kiev and Moscow and other Russian and Ukrainian cities in Tel Aviv, Berlin, Geneva, Paris, Krakow, Warsaw, London, Brussels, San Francisco, Sydney, many other cities. Was... Okay, I got you, it's a list. Okay, so many cities across the world, so as far as uh, Australia. So. On uh, May 31st, a Lithuania representative initiated a flash mob in the European Parliament in support of Alexei Sov. Uh, on May 31st, on the same day, a group of American intellectuals and social activists made a statement in his support. And several people in Russia joined his hunger strike like a supportive hunger strike. So on May 23rd, it was Alexander Shumkov, a Ukrainian soldier uh, who is uh, being held in a Russian pretrial detention center. On May, on May 28, a Russian political prisoner, Stanislav Zimovets, joined his strike. On May 31st, Alexander Kolchenko joined his strike. And Alexander Kolchenko is uh, one of the four people who was tried along with Sensov. He's one of, uh, one of the group. Uh, and the only demand that Kolchenko has is to free Sensov. And June 1st, Shura Burton, a Moscow journalist, uh, joined the hunger strike. Now, of course, this campaign is meant, and, and, and the goal is to attract attention, to make the Russian authorities to uh, cave in to make them at least willing to negotiate this issue, to at least acknowledge the fact that um, he's a political prisoner. Um, recently, the French president made a feeble attempt, in my opinion. So he came to Russia, he visited Russia, he had uh, me a meeting with uh, uh, President Putin. He tried to uh, bring up the subject, but in a very kind of, very roundabout and a mild way, and of course nothing came out of it. This was the only attempt on the level of a state leader. So, so far the Russian authorities haven't shown any signs of caving in so far. And now as a, um, uh, as a conclusion, I just would like you to see some uh, pictures just to show photos uh, of uh, rally of the rallies that took place across the world. Uh, so I'm just going to move away from. I'll use that microphone. Maybe then you can hear me. And I'll just scroll down. There's just a few pictures. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'll just scroll down and show you some. Okay, so this is the an event in Berlin. People are sitting on the Potsdamer Platz in support of Sensol. Um, and this was uh, so. This is uh, June second. So June second in London, Downing Street. It's next to the Prime Minister residence in London. Uh, St. Petersburg, June 1st, well, of course, you can tell that this is Russia because uh, uh, participants of those rallies are usually arrested or detained. So you can see the uh, police forces. Um, oh, this is the picture of the flash mob in the European Parliament. So this is... May 31st. A 
And finally, this is in Kiev. This is a window at a shop in uh, one of the central streets in Kiev. So this is the uh, hashtag Freeze and Salt. And this is a display at the airport in Kiev, at the Kiev International Airport. I think this is this is it. For me. Well, this is this is uh, uh, May 26. This is an event in New York, which was uh, so you can see that the protesters are carrying his pictures, posters with his pictures. This is, oh, this is the uh, Russian embassy in Kiev. This is an event in Paris, May 25th. This is an event in Odessa, also May 25th. Odessa is a Ukrainian, one of the Ukrainian cities. Okay, so I think I'll stop here, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much.